Good afternoon and welcome to this Corbell and AMBO EBI joint webinar. Today's webinar is user experience design for more user friendly applications and today's speakers are Michelle Ida Smith and Nika Forrest Karamaris. My name is Fiera and I'm your host together with my colleague Melissa who will be mapping the chat function today. So just a tiny bit of information about Corbell. Corbell is an Horizon 2020 funded project that uh, combines 11 research infrastructures from the biomedical field. The aim here is to try and work together to transform understanding of biological mechanism and to help to promote this understanding into the faster um, translation into medical care. Now, for a lot of projects that work in this kind of interface, um, modern biological and biomedical research is incredibly complex. And what Corbell is trying to do is, is to help these projects that often work in the interface between different disciplines to um, make it easier to access resources across different research infrastructures. So we're trying to harmonize access and services, for instance, biomedical um, and medical technologies, but also biological samples and data services. So we've got two speakers today. Our first speaker is Michelle, and she's got over 10 years experience in the user experience field and 20 years of experience in website and software design. She's worked on a complex problems such as designing government services, productivity tools for software developers, and she's currently leading the design and project management of EuroPMC, which is a free repository of life science and biomedical uh, literature. She's also co-chair of the UX Cambridge Conference and co-organizes the Cambridge Usability Group. We've also got Nikki with us today, who is the lead user experience designer for Open Targets, and that's based at the EBI. And before he joined the EBI, he worked as a UX consultant and UX lead at SwiftKey. He's got a PhD from the University of Edinburgh in informatics, and has worked, worked as a research fellow at Cambridge University and Trinity College Dublin. He's worked on user-centered design and the evaluation of novel technologies for a variety of settings. And he enjoys spending time with users, developers, and other stakeholders, and specifically works on lean UX methods. So I'm going to start handing over to Michelle now. Hello, everybody. Um, so my name is Michelle, and I'm a product manager and UX architect for EuroPMC.org. And as Vera mentioned, that's a life sciences literature repository here at Emberley BI. And today we're going to give you an introduction to user experience. I'm going to start with a definition of user experience. So this is from the Nielsen Norman Group. User experience encompasses all aspects of the end user's interaction with the company, its services, and its products. And actually, it was Don Norman from the Nielsen Norman Group who invented the term user experience uh, some time ago now, um, over 20 years ago, I think. And his interpretation of that was that he thought the human interface and usability were too narrow, so he wanted to cover all aspects of the person's experience with the system. And I think that sometimes this broader interpretation of what UX is is sometimes forgotten. So I'm going to start off by looking at what UX isn't. So in the UK, we have a saying, it's like putting lipstick on a pig. Um, so hence the picture of this nice pig here. Um, what, what I mean by that is that UX is not a kind of um, magic solution that you introduce at the end of a project or at the last minute to fix problems that your users are experiencing. And as Don Norman said, um, UX is not just about uh, user interface design or usability testing. And also UX is not necessarily just the job of the user experience expert in your team, um, which is something Nikki will touch on more later. So what is UX? Well, a key activity of user experience is user research. And by understanding who your users are and 
uh, what they're trying to use your product or service for and what they're trying to achieve and also what kind of problems they have you start to empathize with them and having empathy with your users is really really important because it means you're better equipped to design systems that truly meet their needs. Um, Peter Drucker, who was a management consultant, um, had this quote, efficiency is doing the things, doing things right, but effectiveness is doing the right thing. And for me, this really summarizes what UX is all about. Um, UX is evidence driven and we base decisions on evidence from user research and that really helps you to prioritize what you need to work on. And the reason for doing this is that it actually delivers real value to your users and to the organization as well. So by focusing on what your users really need and what they want, um, you can deliver real value. So user experience is also about problem solving. Um, it's really important when you're working on any project to try and visualize and uh, put up perhaps on a whiteboard like this or just even on a piece of paper, try and sketch out the problem that you're trying to solve. Um, this is really helpful for getting the team to better understand um, what it is that users are trying to do and, and how you can help them to do it. It's also a team sport. So UX is a very collaborative activity and Nicky will talk a lot more about this in his Open Targets case study after this, so I won't spend too much time talking about this, but it's really critical that your team understands the problems you're trying to solve for users and works together to solve them. So when do you do user experience? Um, this is a question I, I often get asked by people who are fairly new to user experience. Well, ideally, it's throughout the entire project or product life cycle. Um, but I caveat that with ideally, because quite often, um, particularly if you have a user experience expert, they will be brought in partway through a project, often too late when various decisions about how the product or service is going to work will have already been made. So in my experience, it's much better to think about the user experience from the very start and before the project begins. User experience is a continuous process. And this is a fairly typical model uh, or sort of simple process for how user experience works. There are three stages that we go through, starting with discovery, going on to design, and then validating the designs with users. So we explore the problem space before we come up with any design solutions. Um, and then we iteratively create designs and test them with users. And this is a cycle that we go uh, around several times during the process of creating uh, a product or improving a product. So as you can see from this diagram, UX involves many disciplines. So it involves user research, interaction design, information architecture, visual design, usability testing, content strategy, um, workshop facilitation, et cetera. So there are lots of activities and sometimes um, people uh, slightly get the wrong impression and think that user experience is just about perhaps interaction design um, or the sort of uh, user interface design. So let's look at the uh, discovery phase in a little more detail. So the kind of activities that you do during discovery, it's really about uncovering and, and understanding what problems you're trying to solve understanding the business needs and also understanding user needs and trying to sort of uh, represent those in ways that everybody in the team can understand. So discovery is not just um, about asking users questions and certainly these are not the type of questions that you should be asking. So you, you should never really directly ask your users what features they would like, how they think it should work, or how they think you can make a feature better. So what you really need to do is try and approach your project and do some both qualitative and quantitative research with your users. So find out who your primary users are, because um, in most cases you can't design for everybody. Find out uh, who the stakeholders are and make sure you fully understand their needs as well. They're just as important as the end users of the product. 
try and understand how your product or service will be used. So really get to understand the context of use. And this is uh, critical if um, you're thinking about, you know, whether you need to focus perhaps more on a, a mobile type design or, um, you know, what, what the sort of constraints or perhaps um, uh, pressures are on someone using your application at a particular time. Try and get a good understanding of what kind of activities or tasks are involved. What are people trying to do? And also, what are the typical behaviours when they do these things? So you can look at the kind of, if you're designing something completely from scratch, you can look at how they achieve the tasks they're trying to do now. So what, what kind of things do they need and, and what information are they looking for? Also try and understand what people's motivations are for, so what are their goals? Um, because this is something that you can really help them with. Um, what do they want to achieve? But equally, um, what kind of things cause them problems? What are the pain points they experience um, as they're perhaps trying to achieve those goals? And so these are the things that hopefully you can try and address and design for. So one thing that's really critical is that you need to remember to validate assumptions you have about what your users are trying to do uh, or what they want continually. It's very easy to um, try and imagine or, or think you know what your users need, um, but really ultimately you need to observe them, you need to understand firsthand by interviewing them and observing them what they need. So do make sure you you validate all the assumptions that you have. Now let's take a look at the design phase. So ideas are cheap and particularly at the start of a project we'll often do a lot of sketches, a lot of paper prototyping, things that we can put in front of users that give them a sense of how something is going to work but without actually having to code anything or spend a lot of time building anything um, technically. So it's really important to try and, um, you know, sketch out lots and lots of ideas. Nikki will show you more of this kind of approach later. Um, so this was, for example, a prototype that we tested with users for a, a recent project where we were showing highlighted um, terms on the full text of articles. So we can create lots of these um, low fidelity ideas quite quickly. Um, we also look at the user journeys. So we don't just design the interface and the interactions in the interface. We also think about how the whole system is going to work. So the, the users route through the system. And this is really important. And it just tends to look generally like a, a flow diagram. Um, but you might also have um, something which shows a bit more of someone's emotional journey of using a product or service. And as we go through this process and we uh, test the designs with users and we review them ourselves, we critique them, um, we refine our prototypes and then they become higher fidelity and they start to look a little like uh, a sort of real website or web page. Um, and we think about how those all work together. So finally, um, validation. Um, I'm sorry. So um, at this stage, we do usability testing, we look at analytics, and this is really just to try and understand, does the design that we've um, created work as we'd expected for our users? So here, um, the project I mentioned earlier, my colleague Anusha is testing a paper prototype with some users um, in the middle of a training session, and we got some really valuable feedback from this, and it didn't take us very long to do. Um, you just have to be bold and go out and um, be willing to um, speak to people and, and get some feedback from them. So we typically ask them to try out, you know, sort of typical tasks uh, that they would do, um, but instead we're showing them a paper prototype and not a real website or application. So um, we would do this several times before we actually put something that we design into production. But you can also gather information from web analytics. And in the European C team, we use an uh, open source um, product called PIWIC, and that's P-I-W-I-K. And we use that really to gather um, a lot of data on how our uh, web page is being used and how people, um, so for example, this um, screen now is showing you 
um, the kind of number of times that people click on certain links within the page and that um, really helps us to understand people's behavior on the website. It doesn't really tell us why they're doing certain things, so we must also do the usability testing to understand um, you know, where the real problems are and, and why those problems are being experienced. So as I mentioned earlier, UX is a collaborative activity and um, you really need to uh, think about collectively how you can work within your team to improve the user experience. So I really um, urge you to try and with your uh, colleagues to own the user experience for your product or service. Um, this is uh, whether you're a developer, uh, perhaps a curator, a project manager, you work on outreach or the help desk, there's various ways that you can get involved with user experience and you can improve the user experience for your product or service. So for example, um, you can empathize with users, so perhaps you can observe or run some usability tests and gather some user feedback to really answer these questions like who is using our product or service and what are they trying to achieve and why. You can also be a designer in your team because it's really just about problem solving. Um, it's not, not just about creating pretty graphics, it's fundamentally about problem solving and the best ideas um, uh, and solutions come from collaborating with your team. And also find out if your organization has some existing design guidelines or perhaps um, what we'd call a pattern library which has standardized components for um, web development and design. Sometimes these things already exist and you might not be aware of it, but it helps to bring consistency and a good user experience to your application. So I'm now going to hand over to Nikki to speak about the Open Targets case study and their use of lean user experience methods, and I'll be available for the Q&A at the end. Thank you, Michelle. So my name is Nikki, and I'm the lead user experience designer for Open Targets. Um, my part of the seminar is called Why is the Open Targets Platform Intuitive? And I'll try to walk you through a case study where we applied um, this UX approach that uh, Michelle outlined. Um, and I'll show you the steps through which um, we went uh, and also highlight some of the things that you mentioned. <coughs> First, um, a bit of introduction to Open Targets. Um, Open Targets is a collaboration between Biogen and G G JSK um, from the industry, from the pharmaceutical industry. Um, and DBI and the Sanger uh, Institute from um, the academia. And our aim is to help uh, R&D scientists in academia and industry identify the right target for a drug. Um, and you can um, go and uh, look at the site after the talk in the URL that I have below. Um, the important thing that I want to talk about is that um, since we've been developing the site and after we have launched it, uh, people came back to us and they said it's really intuitive. And I'll just read some of the feedback that we got. So one person said, it's very intuitive. You can just search for your target and, your, and you get all the information. It doesn't require any training. It puts a lot of information together in an interface, another user said. And a quite um, descriptive remark is the last one. It's a powerful resource with clear links and easy to use without training, especially for a non bioinformatician. So all this makes it make us very, very happy. Um, and the question that, um, what we're going to explore today is how did we manage it? Why is this platform intuitive? Um, and it's down to three things. So first, we try to know our users, so develop these levels of empathy that Michelle talked about. And secondly, we work as a team, especially in the design and the testing of the platform. And finally, we do it iteratively. So we design and test iteratively in small batches um, throughout um, the development process. So when I joined the project, which was about three years ago, I knew a few things about the area and I tried to kind of very quickly sketch who our users are. So this is my, fir my first description of a drug scientist. I knew that they make drugs and I had an idea that they need to know about genes and diseases and how these relate to each other and how this can be used to develop drugs. And obviously I knew that EBI has a lot of information and we wanted to show this information to these people to help them make decisions. But the point here is that all these are assumptions, so I didn't really know who these people were. And, and also it's very much from an EBI perspective, so I'm saying, okay, we have this data, let's basically show them to people without really understanding what their needs are. So 
what we did in the beginning of the project, together with my colleagues, is we actually went and met these people, and we interviewed them to try to understand uh, what they're trying to achieve, but also spent time with them, observing them as they were doing their, their day-to-day tasks. And the result, uh, and the import, important point here is that uh, when we do this, as Michelle said, we don't ask them what they want. We try to understand what they want to achieve. And there's quite a lot of uh, quite a lot of studies in, in this area which shows that people actually cannot really articulate what they want. And if you ask them very abstractly, but if you observe them, or if you get more into um, the day-to-day work that they do, it's much easier to understand what their goals are. And this is really them and why we try to involve users, why we try to engage with users very, very early in a project. So this reflects my understanding at this stage of what who these people are. And I'm not going to go into a lot of detail on this, but what I'm trying to show is that we do get much closer to, to these people. We understand much more about what they want to achieve. And we're also much more specific on what their needs and pain points are. So specifically, for open targets, what we identified is that people knew that there is information in a lot of different places, but they couldn't really aggregate this information um, to satisfy the information needs. They actually had to rely on another person to do that, and that was quite difficult and created a bottleneck. And, and when we were starting thinking about the solutions, instead of saying, here at DBI we have a lot of useful data, so let's show them to people, we actually tried to specifically address the needs that we show these people have. And so, uh, our solution is basically much more tailored to what, what these people need or what, what the needs that we identified rather than what DBI actually wants to achieve with this service. And so I would recommend that you apply this approach if you have a similar project. And it's actually much easier than people don't normally think. So quite, quite a quick win to know your users is just by starting to write down who you think your users are and what they do. So basically just put your assumptions into paper. And, and then try to look for people like that. Just reach out to your users and find out more about them. And ask them what their, their day-to-day jobs in, involves. Try to observe them if you have the opportunity. But try to center this about what, what they're trying to achieve, not really the service that you're trying to make to begin with. And, and do it as a team. So it's very, very helpful, in fact, to have a number of people doing this kind of user research in parallel because everybody brings a different perspective. And they get together and try to consolidate what you have found. And obviously the reason why we do this is to use insights from this user research to state problems that our design should solve. Um, quite a lot of the things that I mentioned in this talk um, are based on this book, it's called Lean UX. And specifically chapter three is about how you set out to um, start a project that is how you, you, you write down and also address the various assumptions that lie behind it, uh, a project that often are actually not really stated very clearly. And includes, this includes also this um, template that I used for describing users in these four quadrants. So once you have done this, you have an idea of who your users are, then you know more or less, or you have a first idea of what the problems are. And design, as Michelle said, is a problem solving activity. So you try to come up with solutions for these problems. And so open targets again, we try to do this as a team. So we'll sit together and start with a problem statement. So for example, how can we help uh, people get an overview of um, a number of data points that we have at DBI for a particular target disease association? Um, and get, get use pen and paper to basically show a very first cut of the website that we want to show. And you can see how we do this um, together. And also you can see the background um, the, the outputs of our user research, so the various things that we notice by uh, talking and um, observing people, which help us understand a bit better, again, what, what the world of these people is. And we also organize workshops with users. So again, starting with particular problem statements, um, we go together with people who work at the industry and academia. Um, and you can see that we, we did it with a number of groups in parallel. And again, ask them to sketch and solutions to the problems that we identify. Again, just using pen and paper. And, and the point of this is really to explore the alternative. So each of us can come up with a number of solutions, uh, often it's a small number, maybe six or eight for a particular problem. But if you sit together with another, uh, another four people, this, this number of solutions multiplies. So in the beginning, we just go for diversity and, and quantity, really, just come up with a lot of different ways to solve the problems. 
And through that, we do filtering and we also iterate quite a lot. Often, uh, you come up with a better solution if you start from something that's not really great. But within a couple of iterations, it becomes um, something much more tangible and useful. So this, again, an approach that you can apply quite easily, actually. Um, just reserve one morning per month for a design activity. Use pen and paper, so try not to code your solution because this, is, this immediately excludes people who are not as, as good in this particular medium, whereas most people can actually use pen and paper quite efficiently. And try to do it iteratively, so there is a particular approach that I'll, I'll go through in a second, which basically gets people to sketch individually a few solutions and then get together and consolidate and then do it again. And you can see how you progressively build much better solutions within maybe an hour or so by doing this. And do it as a team. So as Michelle said, the design is not really just one person's job. It's actually the whole team who can contribute to this and actually help um, the project progress in that way. And obviously, the next step is to test the designs with users. So you're basically coming up with a solution for a problem that you identified, and you want then to go back to your users and see if it works. And as I said, this is actually there is a very simple methodology called five design sheets. And they, go, they take you through two rounds of sketching uh, in a very, very simple way. And it's all described in an A4 form, uh, an A4 paper. Uh, so if you go to the website, Five Design Sheets, you download, can download the um, um, leaflet that I have uh, on the slide here. And it's really everything that you need to know just to do this for the first time um, is described there. So it's quite, quite easy, actually, to get started on that. So, you know your needs. You have designed some solutions. The next thing is to go back to the, the users and test the, test the solution, see if it actually works for them. And you can see that very often we just do it on paper, as Michelle said. So we might have some, some designs that we came up um, together on paper, and then we show them on paper to people and ask them to work with them. And the important thing, again, is that we don't ask them what they like. And this is one of the good reasons why actually starting with low fidelity things, things that don't really look like the actual website works quite well. And uh, because you focus away from the aesthetics and more into the actual usefulness of what you're trying to design. And what we really try to understand is if the design solves the problem, the problem that we identified as an important issue, something that's worth our time working on in the beginning. As I said, it's an iterative process. So uh, in Open Tigers, we have a page which uh, we call it the evidence page, which is the page that summarizes the relationship between a gene and a disease, um, and where it really are real data, our, our, our important data sit. And, and you can see that we started just by a sketch. It was a sketch that we did together. In fact, we did it on um, this sketching session that I showed there earlier in our studio. Uh, we showed it to people for the first time, and you can see that the feedback that they gave us um, is annotated here on the sketch with different, uh, we use different colors for, for the feedback we got from different people. So that was round one. And then we redraw it. This time we give a bit more emphasis on the actual data that we have um, based on the information that we collected on user research and also from the first sketching session. But you see still it's like a template. And people are just telling us what kind of things they expect to see on a page like that. And then it becomes a bit more concrete. So we came up with this way of visualizing the evidence, which we call the flower. And we kind of thought that there might be fewer data types that we can show, actually, based on what we saw. And then closer to the launch, um, we had a working prototype. Something was working on the browser. And this was not actually a web-based. And it was, it was sitting locally in a, in a browser of one of our developers, but it had some interactive features that we saw. And you can see in this a particular mock-up, uh, the tick marks, and the tick marks are actually positive feedback that we got. But the point here is that you don't arrive to something like this without going through the previous stages. We had to go through the stages of low fidelity prototyping and all this engagement that we had with people to actually come up with something that they found um, useful and useful and, and intuitive. So this took us seven iterations. This is the actual work plan when we're working on this. Uh, for each iteration, we had a design session and then a testing uh, and review session. Um, and overall, it was really seven, uh, seven circles that we went through. And this included everything from, from the original designs, the workshops, as well as the usability testing. So it was relatively fast. 
Um, but the point is also we didn't stop there. So once um, the site was released, we continued to ask people for feedback. So there are elements of the website that we know we can improve. Um, and very, very regularly, we organize uh, usability sessions and also uh, design sessions where we ask people to give us feedback on the things that we have. And we continuously try to improve it and make it even more intuitive. Um, and this is a process that again involves everything, so everyone. So our developers are part of this. And we review uh, the feedback that we get with the whole team. And um, one question that many people ask is how many people to test with. Um, and there's been some studies which found out that um, if you do one test with, say, eight people, you might find five problems. But actually, if you do two tests just with three people, overall you find more problems. So the point behind that is that it's really much better if you go out and ask people for feedback very frequently, even if you just actually ask just three people, instead of um, doing a bigger test, say, with 30 people, but just do this every, every year or every two years. So really, it's the regular engagement with users that actually gives you the insights that you need to improve uh, the service that you have. So again, this is not very difficult to do. Uh, try to resolve one warning per month for a feedback session. So you're designed to just a few users, but do it as a team. Include your teammates in the feedback session. It's very important to include the person who actually works on the, on the development of the, of the um, feature itself. And, and ask for feedback early and often. And of course, later on, act on this feedback. So um, the reason why we do this is really because we want to make improvements, not just to have a record of engagement with people in a very long backlog of things that we want to fix. And there's a book called Don't Make Me Think. And specifically, they talk about web design in general, but uh, specifically chapter nine is about usability testing. So this is uh, another recommended reading. And I also like to mention um, another initiative that the EBI is part of. It's called User Experience for Life Sciences. Um, and it's headed by the Pistoia Alliance, Alliance. So this involves a number of professionals from uh, several organizations. And what we're trying to do is really to build a community of practitioners in, interested in user experience design and, and also develop tools um, specifically tailored for, for the needs that we have within the life sciences. And so feel free to check this out from this URL and also um, you can join uh, this group as well if you're interested in this area. Um, this is really it. I'd like to thank our design and testing participants for open targets and, and also the people who uh, supported us, the development team and the leadership team. And also all our colleagues at the Genome Campus, including Michelle, we're a very nice, uh, actually quite large community now of people interested in UX. And I think we're ready to get your questions now. So one of the questions I'd like to ask to both Nikki and Michelle is, where do you find users that can either help you with testing or with the initial interview? Um, well, it's actually quite a challenge sometimes, and it really depends on the nature of the thing that you're designing. So I'll, I'll um, talk a little bit about how we do that, and then um, Nikki can perhaps mention how they approach that in his project, which was a bit different. So Europe PMC is used by um, a very wide variety of people, so researchers of different career levels, in, in, perhaps in um, institutes, uh, universities, also in clinical settings, in private companies. Um, it's also used by curators, members of the public, so it's very wide, broad, um, potential user base. So um, we tackle that in various ways. Obviously, we have some researchers on campus here at the Genome Campus, so we have tried recruiting people there. Uh, we've contacted um, people who've responded to surveys in the past and said that they're, they're happy to be contacted. So it's quite a good way if you're running a survey on your website, you can always ask people if they're willing to be contacted. Um, for user research. Um, we've also um, just reached out to different universities to see if there's people there who would be willing to um, carry out some testing. You can also put like a little advert on your, if you've got a website um, or, or an application, you can always put an advert in it um, asking, saying that you're looking for people to help improve the product and sometimes people will um, get involved that way. Um, so there's many ways that you can reach people. If you have a commercial product, then obviously you, you, you perhaps have a, um, a user base that uh, have licenses for it that you can contact. Um, Nikki, would you like to talk a little bit? Yeah. So 
for us, because we're looking at people specifically working in drug development, obviously our industrial partners were very helpful. And I think one of the strengths of this project is that we had industrial participation from the beginning. Um, so they helped us a lot with recruiting and obviously this involved us visiting these people where they work. Um, and, but the nice thing about this is also uh, once one company is involved, the others also get quite curious about it. So this open targets have, has been discussed in a lot of um, industrial meetings, including the one that the EBI hosts. So basically this gives us um, the opportunity to, to approach other companies and also um, go and talk to people there. Um, it, it can be a struggle. I mean, for, for sometimes for more general things that we do, um, we don't have specific contacts that we go to. But on the other hand, there is a very big community of researchers, uh, and we basically try to use our contacts and, and um, effectively use methods where we can um, just go and get people. Um, there are also agencies that can find users um, if you work for a company. So you can hire another company that can uh, do recruitment for you, but they tend to be quite expensive. Okay, thank you. Um, we've got a question on chat from Tricia, and she says, um, I see you often sketch ideas on large wall or desk areas. Do you have any experience doing this via an online whiteboard or one node wireframing area, um, as offices are sometimes compact without any large areas to draw on? And I definitely get that point. Yeah, yeah, this is a common problem. Um, one where I sort of had battles trying to find wall space and places to do this kind of collaborative work. Uh, yes, there are online tools that you can use. Um, so uh, one that is quite popular is a tool called Mural, um, which you can use. It's got uh, kind of the ability to put um, like post virtual post-it notes up um, and you can kind of collate information there. Um, I think there are some virtual whiteboard tools. I haven't had experience in using those personally to do sketching. Um, but I have heard about people, um, so a colleague of mine actually works remotely with a team that's based in the US and he's based in the UK and he has a webcam focused on a whiteboard next to his desk and he sketches on the whiteboard and has discussions with them um, over uh, virtual meeting software or Skype. So um, there, are, there are many tools out there because more and more UX teams are having to work remotely um, with other teams across the globe. Yes, so I, I used to be, use um, Google Drawings actually. So often I would just try to make a drawing um, on 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 the Google Drawing and then share it with other people. Um, you can put if you make if you use things like Balsamic, you can put um, your wireframes online. Um, a lot of people now use a, a tool called Envision. Envision. Yeah, so which allows you to share things. But I think. Um, there's a lot of value in actually externalizing something you have done and sharing it. Even 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 if your team is remote, there might be some people uh, who might be interested in what you do. So in in the in the in SwiftKey where I used to work, I just had a desk. But effectively, I, I decorated the wall around my desk with what we'll be working on now um, at, at the given time, and then yeah, this actually creates a lot of attention. So often you can use the corridors, and this is just to to basically share with other people what you're doing and get. Um, the interest and the feedback from the company that you're part of to see that there's something creative going on um, and to create a more of, more of a culture of sharing because when things are all in the computer, you know, people have to know where the links are and so on. If, if there is, even if, if your work will be partially online, I think just, just putting things out um, for people to give feedback is actually quite valuable. I think at Redgate, they had a lot of, Michelle used to work for a company called Redgate. And, and they used to shape their space, as far as I know, with yes. places where people give feedback. Yes, yeah, yes. had a lot of, um, a so lot of areas. Communal areas, yeah. yeah. Um, so we used to use whiteboard paint on the walls, so that every wall could become a whiteboard. Yeah. Um, and also, um, as a UX designer, having a role, bigger roll of brown paper is invaluable, because you can kind of take a big piece of brown paper, sort of stick sketches and um, ideas, post-it notes on it, roll it up and take it back to your office. So it doesn't necessarily have to be up permanently, but it's a good way to be um, able to transport some of the things that you're working on. Yeah. I hope that answers your question, <laughs> gives you some ideas. Okay, good. That seems to answer the question. So one other thing that we could um, ask as well is what kind of metrics you could use to measure UX? So for us, 
fundamentally throughout development, we really use the qualitative feedback that people give us. So, and we focus on two things. Um, every time we have something we ask, we try to understand what, what is it that we have to improve. Um, and often after a couple of iterations, you, you have this sense that this is good enough and to be released. And then you'll get more feedback from more people once, once it is online. And this is, uh, this is actually quite qualitative. Um, and also, we try to see whether we meet our goals. So, you know, does, does the design solve people's from solve people's problems fundamentally? So this is a qualitative part. Um, once um, a feature is, is released, obviously you can use analytics, as um, uh, Michelle has mentioned. Uh, so we, we have um, we, we use a, a framework called Heart, um, which breaks down the user experience into five elements, and for each of them you can collect. And effectively analytics from from the web to see uh, if people are behaving as you you like them to behave. Um, but I think this this kind of also A/B testing is a very important uh, method which we don't actually use very much for open targets, but we can use it for other things uh, within the BI where we have a lot of traffic. So I think it's it's a combination of qualitative and quantitative uh, metrics. But in my experience, um, it's helpful to go quantitative when once you have a good idea of um, the actual problem you want to solve and, and, and a sense that the designs that we came up with um, are in the right direction. And I think um, you get this through the interaction that we have, you have with people and the feedback that they give you. Yeah, so I think um, the framework that Nikki mentioned, Heart, is, um, is, is a good one to look up. Um, it looks at various different um, types of metrics like um, user engagement, uh, kind of re retaining your users, um, their level of um, uh, kind of satisfaction with the product. Um, so, I mean, we, we try to use that there are some sort of standard ways of measuring things like user satisfaction. So an industry um, standard is um, called the Net Promoter Score or NPS. Um, that's a way of uh, trying to assess user satisfaction. Um, it's basically asking people on a scale um, how likely they are to recommend something to a friend or colleague. Um, in usability testing, we also use um, something called um, the system usability score, which is just a way to sort of measure and assess people's um, uh, pe people's sort of the ease of use of the of the product. Um, but metrics should really be aligned to your um, overall goals with a project. So yeah, trying to focus on what your goals are and you know what. Kind of, so it's not just about kind of seeing numbers go up. It's really about, you know, um, are you helping your users to achieve their goals as well, and finding a way to measure that. Yeah, and actually, one of from my experience again, um, when people try to collect quantitative metrics, basically they go to two extremes. Either they they brainstorm a very long list, because everybody has a metric that they're interested in, and this this actually makes it almost unmanageable because there's no focus in the company about you know, what, what the service is about, or to go to the other extreme to try to optimize one particular metric and often at the expense of everything else. So for example, you might want to optimize sign up, but then you don't actually look at how many people and how, how many people are actually using the site or even if you're selling something, you know, whether your sales go up, for example, but you might have more users. So I think it requires, I think it requires a bit of balance. Obviously you need to have the numbers often to convince um, your stakeholders are doing the right thing, but effectively the numbers should be founded on a good understanding of who your users are and why you're offering the service that you're offering. Okay, if there are no more questions, I will thank today's speaker, Nikki and Michelle. Thank you very much for joining us and to the attendees as well. And through the EBI and Corbell website, we will be announcing future webinars. Thank you very much.